before Dwayne Wade. He's the kind of guy you just depend on. He would show up for the every, very big games, and uh, uh, he was uh, a quiet, outstanding uh, ball player. Before Dean Memminger. He would stand out without uh, making a lot of noise. He, he, he just knocked people around really good, if I were to describe it. Even before there was Al McGuire. I think all Marquette alumni were proud that he was uh, you know, a Marquette alum in the NFL. There was a star at Marquette playing a sport that vanished over 50 years ago. George's career was way above expectations. His name is George Andre. He is the Doomsday Warrior. Michigan. I made a few honors playing high school ball, made All-State in Michigan, and was offered some scholarships. We used to call him sport because that's, he was good at everything, all the sports. He, uh, in high school, I mean, he played guard. He was 6'6". Now, that was un unheard of in those days, you know, in the 50s. He was a heck of a good player, and uh, that's what the family expected. <laughs> I took it from there, and I just, uh, uh, or the award of the scholarship to Michigan State, Marquette, and I kind of went to Marquette pri primarily because um, it was a Catholic university, I'm Catholic. Plus my mother says a good Catholic boy should go to a good Catholic school. I was the uh, tallest tight ends in the, in the country. And I don't know if there was anybody 6'8 that would carry that ball like I could. As far as an end, he was, you know, get the ball anywhere near me and he'd get it. So he was, he was very athletic. Marquette hadn't had a winning season since 1953, and the Warriors made the decision in 1959 to bring back esteemed head coach Lyle Blackburn, who had previously led the NFL's Green Bay Packers. And he came to the uh, university, and uh, I played under him my junior year. He had a lot of wisdom, he had a lot of understanding, he, uh, he kind of knew the way it was supposed to work. He was very verbose on the sidelines, uh, in practices, and uh, he was after he was after the guys. I mean, he he came after the guys to make to, to try and improve them. He was a coach that you could play for a lot better than the coaches we previously had. I think Marquette thought this was the last uh, big hurrah. Everybody was hopeful that uh, things were on the way up. The Marquette Warriors would end that year with a record of three and seven. But the news that followed the conclusion of the season would leave players, coaches, students, and alumni shocked. Well, we woke up the next morning and we heard that the university was going to make an announcement. And uh, nobody knew exactly what it was. So when it came out, I, I got a call from a couple, from a couple of guys and I said, you're, kid, you're joking, aren't you? So we went up to the athletic department and, you know, we wanted to verify all this. So we walked, you know, we went in there and talked to the coaches and they were as shocked as we were. They were not notified that they were going to drop the program. I remember the students going down the avenue and going down the side streets and groups and they said, we want football, we want football. And uh, uh, everyone was very, very sad. And that's how I felt. I said, how can they do that? You know, the medical college uh, at Marquette was draining uh, the finances from the university pretty severely. It was uh, losing two hundred dollars to $400,000 a year, which back in the, the late 50s uh, was a significant amount of money. We got several people who were willing to donate money, but we went to the school and the school says, no. That's it. That's it. We heard that oh, they're going to take your scholarships away. 
So, you know, I says, well, no, that's impossible because, you know, the only way we can lose our scholarship is by not maintaining a C average and uh, being in a disciplinary action against the university. So I went and I saw the president of the uh, athletic board and, and I said, what is this about losing the scholarship? He says, yeah. He says, you're going to, we're taking away your scholarship. You know, you're, you're going to get your tuition, but your room and board and all the, every, the books. I said, they're, they're, we're going to discontinue all that. I said, how can that be? And, and he said, we're running a business here. And I really felt it was a, a moral, a moral decision. I mean, it was a moral commitment that they made. And I said, well, that was a business decision you made. And, uh, and I made a decision in good faith and everything else. I felt bad, and of course George was devastated. That was between his junior and senior year. As it turned out, as far as football is concerned, it didn't, probably, probably didn't hurt him a bit. He loved football. Uh, it was his, his scholarship meant everything to him, so I felt very bad because, um, because I knew it meant a lot to George. And, um, and the whole football program was um, a big part of the family. He had several offers, and for some reason, he, he picked Tulsa. And uh, they could uh, transfer and play immediately because uh, the school dropped the sport. I chose Tulsa and uh, went down there, drove down there, and uh, was down there about three weeks. And I noticed I wasn't even enrolled in any classes. So I said, no, I didn't think this was good. So after about three, four weeks, I was thinking about the gal I met at Marquette. And I think I was thinking to myself, you know, maybe, maybe I belong back at Marquette. You know what I'm saying? He stepped on my foot in the cafeteria line at Marquette. Turned around and and she says, "Ouch!" And I'm looking and I don't see anybody because she didn't come up to my belt buckle. I mean, this a little over my belt buckle. And I says, um, "What are you doing down there?" And that was, you know, that that was the. Uh, the start of our, our relationship there, kind of. I said, this little girl's got a lot of spunk. Our first date was for an M Club party. And that's when it dawned on him I was a girl and he could actually date me. We didn't just have to be friends. Without football his senior year, George focused on his academics. But as he was leaving a program that was given up for dead, he didn't know he'd be moving on to one that was just coming to life. I had a... Uh, contact from the Cowboys and Gil Brandt specifically. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I says, you know, how, how, this is an opportunity again. And I says, you know, it, how good am I? I says, I, I'd like to know how good I am and put it to rest. Cause I didn't reach my full potential at Marquette. So they sent a guy named Art Felker who was working for the mark in that area, who was a scout in that area. And so he came up and he, uh, he says, uh, we, uh, you know, we'd like to have you. And at the time uh, uh, that I signed him, I think he weighed about 230. Little bit, gained a little bit of weight since then, but he weighed about 230. And uh, I gave him $500 and I said, find a, a studio uh, where you can get some weight uh, put on you. And uh, I think when he came to our first training camp, he probably weighed about 245. He didn't uh, play his senior year and he was a little bit rusty, but he was a big guy and he had a great attitude and he was very intense when he got his uniform on. I was told, you know, that uh, there's no way you'd ever make it. There's no way, you know, you, by not playing your last year, you would be, you know, you're just wasting your time and everything else. And I'm glad I made that decision. But uh, if I would have listened to everybody else, I would have, I would have not tried it. The Cowboys drafted Andre 82nd overall in the sixth round of the 1962 NFL Draft. Dallas was just two years removed from a winless inaugural season, but were building a team for the ages. Starting at the defensive line, they would draft Bob Lilly, George Andre, Jethro Pugh, Willie Towns, and Larry Cole creating one of the most formidable front fours in the history of the game, the doomsday defense. When you win zero games and lose 11 and win tie, you gotta do something different. And, and we did a lot of things different. Coach Landry was in, installing the flex defense about the time George came along. And 
Nobody could learn it in one year, but George probably learned more of it in one year than any of us. I don't know where we got the name Doomsday Defense from. I don't know if it came from uh, Dallas sports writers, from National Deal or anything else. I don't know. I just woke up one morning and we were called the Doomsday Defense. Doomsday Defense was pretty good. We had really good players uh, and the system was really good. But whenever you have players like Bob Lilly and George Andre that are Pro Bowl players on your defensive line, how can you be anything but good? It took the Cowboys seven seasons to make their first postseason appearance, but they lost to the Green Bay Packers in the 1966 NFL Championship. However, Dallas got their second chance at the Packers in the 1967 NFL Championship, a game that would go down as one of the greatest matches in NFL history, the Ice Bowl. I'm from Michigan. And, uh, you know, we do have some cold weather up there, but I've never experienced anything like this. And we're going to play a football game. So we were uh, going to the stadium on the bus, and all the talk was about how cold it was. And I knew we were in trouble, I, you know, because all I heard was cold, cold, cold. And I wasn't going to add to that conversation. And he said, Bob, it's already 10 below out there, and it's 35-mile-an-hour wind. He said, it's going to be cold. A lot of these guys on this team have never played in weather like this. He said, let's go out there with no warm-ups. I said, okay, you know, and, and then I realized when I went out on the field, I, I grew up in Texas. I've never been in weather like that either. I couldn't believe it. I mean, man, it was like 25 below zero, and the wind was just blowing. We had icicles form in our nose. They were sticking down about two inches, and the trainers from Green Bay came over and said, you guys need to go back in and let those icicles melt and don't pull them out because it'll pull the membranes of your nose out. And then keep a bottle of Vaseline with you and keep your nostrils lubricated as well as your lips. And then of course the first play of the game, the referee forgot to put Vaseline on their lips. They pulled half their lip off and they had to call a timeout. It was like playing on ice. Literally we had, uh, at that time, we used to have uh, plastic uh, tips on our shoes. And uh, Bobby Hayes, I remember, who was at the time the world's fastest human, came into the league. Bobby took off all his spikes. So all the thing was sticking out was a stem, a screw stem, if you would. So here he had 10 screw stems in it so he could get some traction. And that's what he did. He made spike shoes out of it because you couldn't step into the ice. It couldn't, you couldn't get any grip at all. I mean, the defenses didn't exist. Everyone was slipping and sliding and trying to get in the way of the ball carrier. But other than that, it was one of those games that should not have been played. They got off the two quick touchdowns and uh, in the first quarter, and uh, 14 to nothing, and man, well that shook us up. Our star dropped back to pass, and Willie Towns came in and uh, got a hold of star and uh, knocked the ball loose, and it was right there in front of me, and it just bounced up into my hands, and uh, I lumbered into the end zone. That's the way they called it. I was sitting in our den, in Dallas with the doors and windows open, the weather was that nice, watching the game on TV and just screaming a blue streak. I scared our little boys. They, they were crying. They thought mommy had lost it. <laughs> Here's an ice bowl game. It's freezing out and uh, he picks up a fumble and runs it for a touchdown. <laughs> what greater experience you can have. With the Cowboys leading 17-14 late in the fourth quarter, the Packers drove the ball down to the one yard line. Green Bay quarterback Bart Starr would call the team's final timeout with 16 seconds left on third and goal. It wasn't Lombardi's call, it was Starr's call that, that, that he thought he was, gonna, he was gonna carry the ball and he was gonna win it or lose it. He wasn't gonna put it on anybody else. He told Lombardi, and Lombardi said, let's get the hell out of here, just run it. They just had more people up the middle pushing than we had stopping, you know and George really could do nothing about that. I was there trying to help Jethro and Leroy and Chuck Cowley, and, and we, we didn't hold them, they, they scored. I think we got cheated, obviously. I think we were a better team, we should have played better. We only scored on goofy fluke plays, you know, we didn't grind anything out. It was the quietest ride home on that plane. We just wanted to get back to Dallas. Clint Murkison, our team owner, had provided for a really nice New Year's Eve party, a dinner and all of that. When the, the plane got in, of course, we all thought we were going to win the game, so it was going to be a really wonderful party, and it was almost like going to a funeral. I think we all resolved the fact that we lost that game, and we never wanted to go into a game where we thought uh, 
we would be out snookered again, you know. It was just devastating. And we carry that, I think we carry that loss into next season. After that game, George and the Cowboys would go on to lose consecutive conference playoff games to the Cleveland Browns and then Super Bowl V to the Baltimore Colts in 1970. But Dallas would finally get over the hump the following season. We had the uh, label that we couldn't win the big one. And, uh, you know, it came from all the defeats and the big games that we, that we, that we suffered. And we got tired of hearing about this. Uh, and especially, I think it motivated us going into Super Bowl four, uh, six against Miami. We were the first team to ever keep somebody out of the end zone in any Super Bowl. We only allowed uh, three points, so uh, we were very, uh, we were happy to kind of get rid of that stigma where we couldn't win the big one. Everybody asks, you know, what was it like playing in the Super Bowl? And and I always, and to this day, you know, t as far as I was concerned. Playing in the NFC Championship game was a, cha was a world championship. And that's the way I approached it. Playing Green Bay to get to play Oakland, the Green Bay game was a championship game. George Andre ended his NFL career in 1972 after playing 141 grueling NFL games. In 11 seasons with the Cowboys, he made the 1962 All-Rookie Team, appeared in five Pro Bowls, earned one NFL All-Pro selection, and three second-team nominations. And he says, it's time for you to retire. So I retired. <laughs> so, uh, to be honest with you, he, yeah, that's the way it worked. You know, he says, uh, you know, Judge George, he says, I appreciate everything you've done uh, and everything else, he says, but I'm not going to invite you back. You know, you had a great career and, 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 and uh, appreciate your contributions to the Cowboys. George's career was way above expectations. Uh, I think any time that you're picked in the fifth or sixth round and somebody that hadn't played football the previous year and he came in and did what he did, uh, and uh, I think that that speaks for itself. I'm pretty proud of, of my playing career and, uh, you know, it. Uh, it brought me a lot of joy, it brought me a lot of heartaches. I felt like I took advantage of, uh, of the opportunities that it presented, uh, not only in the football game, but also in business. Being as a player on a successful team, a Super Bowl team, follows you the rest of your life. George was a stalwart. Never, never missed a game. I don't think he ever missed a game. Played with bad knees, bad elbow, cuts and bruises and all the things in today's world, a lot of guys wouldn't play with. You could count on him, especially in a big game. He was always had his head in a big game, and he played very well. We knew George was going to make it. He was that type of guy. He's a good man. <laughs>